Hello, everybody. You know, we are in an absolute bizarro world right now. And when we sit back and take a look at the investing commodities, you look at the markets, where do I put my money? I absolutely have to rely on experts around the world. And I happen to have a fantastic one today. I have David Allen. He is the CFA Managing Director of Octane Investments. Stop by the podcast today. Welcome, David. So great to be here, Stu. How are you? I really enjoyed our first conversation. And when we're, for our podcast listeners, you look marvelous, as they say in the show business world. You've got a beautiful fish behind you as a sailfish. Give me a little bit about what's going on, because that's a good looking backdrop you got there. Thank you so much. Well, thankfully, in, in this day and age, when you go out deep sea fishing, as far as I know, it's catch and release. So... Right. You bring, the, you bring the fish to the side, the first mate measures from bill to tail, and you let it go. This fish, I think it's a blue marlin, actually. There's a sailfish in another room. Oh, okay. Uh, but both were caught by my grandfather, Charles Alfred Allen, off the coast of the New Jersey shore, probably 30, 40 miles off of the coast of uh, Ocean City, which is sort of south of Atlantic City. Nice. And these things were stuffed. It's the real fish. Stuffed, you know, within a couple of days of their, their being caught. Wow. And this thing... This beautiful fish was in storage for a long time. And I'm, wow. I'm joining you from Lyme, Connecticut, and it took me a while, but got this house about three years ago and it, it just earned a, a nice spot. So I'm oh, just it's... happy happy to be here on the air with you and mention my grandfather's name. I think it's fabulous. What an honor to have your fish on the podcast. So, you know, you know what's fun though? When you and I got to meet each other on LinkedIn, you're up in the New York area and you're up there all the time and you're, you are, you are a cross between energy and finance. And can you tell us a little bit about what you were talking about in your, in your video? Cause you are a weird beast. And I mean that in a very, very good way. I mean, think about that. People are not understanding what economic impacts energy has sometimes. You know, I really appreciate that. I am a weird beast. I really <laughs> cut my teeth on the global markets and tracking commodities in the first one third of my career. So I started in 1987 and I was an FX trader in New York. So I'll date myself. I was a dollar Deutschmark trader in 1992 when George Soros and Stanley Druckenmuller broke the Bank of England. Uh, we don't really have to talk about George Soros's politics, but way back when there was only about $25 billion in global macro hedge funds. And they made a billion dollars in one, in one day by ejecting the British pound from the ERM. And they made about a billion dollars. And back then it was all the money in the world. Now fast forward to, to today, depending on how you count it, there are something like four or $5 trillion in hedge funds. So, so the financial industry has obviously grown leaps and bounds. But back to your question, you know, what am I doing at Octane? It's interesting. I really wasn't interested in the energy space until after the pandemic. Now, if we look back at the last 15 years, right. the, the industry itself had a couple of near-death experiences. And I, I know you know this. The first happened, again, I'll go back to Wall Street, in starting, you know, starting 2010, right. companies really got interested in fracking. They really, they really improved technology since then. But a, a guy, you, I know you know the story, Aubrey McClendon came to Wall Street and said, this is groundbreaking, no pun intended. And Wall Street sent tens of billions of dollars of capital to him, to Pioneer and to others. And they said, yay, what a free for all. We're going to frack, frack, frack. Well, what happens when you frack, frack, frack? You overproduce, right? And then they had a little global knife fight with the Saudis and they lost. So we know what happened. You look right. at the commodity price in 2015, 2016, a third yeah. of the companies went out of business. They had to restructure. Pioneer ended up with ExxonMobil ultimately. Yep. That, was, that was episode number one. Episode number two, of course, is the pandemic where you saw another near-death experience. April 2020, the front yep. month of crude traded negative. We, we in the wow. canyons of New York, we watched mouths agape. How, how could this pro possibly happen? Right. So after those two big sort of macro episodes, Stu, what happened was the C-suites in Houston, as well yep. as, as 
you know, allocators in New York knew that they had to return capital to shareholders. So, yep. you know, I was at a, a really good global firm for nine years and during this time as, as the world was coming out of the pandemic. And I saw a lot of big Northeast allocators, a lot of public funds right. uh, on the East Coast get out of traditional energy wholesale. So, so they started with Canadian tar sands. They said, you know what, this doesn't pass muster from our right. ESG screen. And I said, okay, that, that sort of makes sense. It's very expensive to get those BTUs out of the ground. And then they went to thermal coal, saying that thermal coal is bad and we're going get, to get out of that. But the next step was a really radical step, Stu, and that was sort of fully getting out of all scope one and scope two emissions. So, so every company, every fracker, Every integrated right. company, even a lot of the even a lot of the refiners and marketers. Now, what's what's a little bit odd about this? And, and I'm friends with these people. These people are allocating 50 billion, 150 billion, 300 billion. I'm talking about our own state sovereign wealth funds here in the Northeast. Right. And I would call them, and I would have a very professional, private, friendly conversation. It would sort of go okay. like this: Okay, I got your email. You're getting out of these 42 companies that we've invested for you. You know that the reason that the United States has a smaller carbon footprint now, this is, right. call it 2021, than 2005, is because of these very companies. Exactly. These companies that were, so we are collectively retiring our coal fleet, the natural gas for dry methane right. burns a lot cleaner. It's turned into the backbone of our fleet generation. and. Yep. You still want to sell these? And one more thing, as I'm having my polite, friendly, collegial conversation with my client, is these things are trading at six and a half times forward earnings. Right. What and the rest response? of your, what's that? What was their response? It's this. I know. Oh. I know. It's, 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 it's become political. So it has. It's, it's become political. And these are smart people. I think a lot of them are centrist. I would call them Reagan Democrats, these sort of high functionaries at these very powerful state pension plans. And they're good people. They're good people. And they, and they frankly, their, their hard works to ensures that, you know, if they get good returns, the taxpayer doesn't bear the burden of retiring teachers and firemen. And right. they do a great job. But, but what they saw in some of these state capitals were, you know, both chambers of the legislature going full Democrat. And as right. you know, in politics, the squeakiest wheel is the, is the one that's the loudest. Right. And so in some of these pension plans, they felt that there could be a forced overnight divestment. And they thought that was really bad. So so they did the right thing. They they created panels and they wrote white papers, like pretty smart white papers saying, hey, give us eight years and we'll fully divest. And so, uh, you know, a few of them divested sooner rather than later. So so for my, for my career, which is, and, and this is my volunteer, you mentioned CFA, I earned my charter back in 07. I'm now chairman of CFA Society of New York. We have 11,000 members. Nice. We're, very, we're very much embedded in Wall Street. It's a wonderful, nice. wonderful volunteer position that I have. And you know, the, the chartered financial analyst is all about you know, looking at balance sheets, under, under, understanding the macro, but also understanding the micro. And yeah. when I look at, you look at the allocators globally who've signed up for the Paris Accord, you look right. at active asset managers who are hired by these allocators who have signed up for GFANS, which is Glasgow Financial Accord for Net Zero. When you combine those two, you strip out double counting, but combine those two by Octane's calculation, it's about 40 or $50 trillion of allocators who have forsworn traditional energy. Now, what does that mean? Finance 101, you've got a vacuum, you've got a vacuum and the vacuum needs to be filled. So Octane Investments, is we, we have we have an ETF. I don't want to talk about it now, but right. people can go to my website, octane.nyc, and see what we're doing. Uh, but right. we believe that we're deploying capital, ETF capital, into a vacuum, and we believe we've built a very cheap portfolio. Isn't that neat? And what's that? I said, that, isn't that neat? That's cool. It's fun. It's fun. And, and, and not a week passes to when we see hard evidence from the market that the hyperscalers, yep. right, the Metas, the Microsofts, the Googles, can't afford to, to, to grow without more energy. I, I wish it could all come from nuclear, but we don't have that many mothballed Three Mile Islands to restart. Um, I did not have the restarting of Three Mile Island on my bingo card last week. Did not have that anywhere near it. And I couldn't be happier about that. The, but a net zero 
AI has effectively killed the ability for us to even think about net zero. Agreed. Agreed. One hundred percent. It is crazy. So, so I think I think we we had fun talking about about you know content for today and and for your listeners and you know one of the themes that we talked about was behavioral finance and yes. Daniel Daniel Kahneman, whom we lost this year, he died in the second quarter, I think, but he was a famous guy. I met him about twenty years ago after he had won the Nobel Prize in economics and the groundbreaking work that he did with another scholar called. Amos Tversky was understanding how how be- human behavior and behavioral weaknesses and psychological weaknesses right. have impaired our ability to have an efficient market. So so this really goes back to an overarching theme in this, which is our brains were right. perfected about two hundred thousand years ago, and they were perfected two hundred thousand years ago. And, and the way our brains were perfected has sort of frozen because with modern, modern technology and modern civilization, you know, there really isn't a whole, there really isn't a whole lot of running away from saber tooth tigers. So our brain sort of froze in development about 200,000 years ago. And what we're dealing with today are normal legacies, vestigial legacies from our right. brains of 200,000 years ago. I, I love the way where you're going with this, but when you when we sit back and look at the you describe the oil field and when they got all of the money and they went ballistic and going, we're gonna drill baby drill, and then they were not fiscally responsible with their money. But the ESG movement came in and they wheeled it in. And ESG movement did do a good thing for the oil and gas EMP operators. They did become fiscally responsible. And you take a look at Chevron and Exxon and all of the the individual owners, 50% of the oil is created by the individuals and they're giving their money back to the investors hand over fist and being fiscally responsible. So ESG did a great thing in the oil and gas space as we as we got learned how to do that. Total Energies, as I call them on the show, and BP did not learn nearly as fast as their American counterparts. It's so true. And I, you, you mentioned European integrated. I've, I've gotten out of a couple of those European integrateds because they're spending way too much money on, say, 20 year hydrogen projects. Oh. And, but a couple of them are good. And they're, they're uh, with an all cap value lens. We, we find one or two of them are very good. They're very embedded. I'll give right. you an interesting, interesting thought about, about a follow on thought about that is because you mentioned ESG. You look back. So the Paris Accord was, was 2015, 2016, right. back when the pioneers of the world were, were overproducing. So right. frozen in time, this Paris Accord, because I think oil was cheap and underestimated. That's a behavioral thing. It's sort of a herd behavior thing. Right. But, but going, going back to the behavioral question, this all stems from the idea that there's an idea of what's the law of least effort. Now, you probably know this is something like the human consumes about 20% of their calories running the brain. You know, our brain is obviously our, our right. relative superpower on this planet. And a lot of the a lot of the things around behavioral finance are about mental shortcuts, okay. and they call them heuristics. So a heuristic is we get that if you have ten thousand hours talking about you know private equity, uh, you can use these shortcuts and heuristics. Right. But it's it's actually part of our DNA and our brain brain configuration to favor shortcuts. So what oh. are some of the sh- what are some of the shortcuts that either aid or impair the thinking about sustainability and investing? Well, you know you've got You've yep. got people managing big public funds who have been told a million times that, you know, coal will be stranded and it's a complete waste of money. So they stop investing right. or, you know, fracking is going to be done within 10 years. So they, they actually pull out. In the meantime, if you want to talk about Magnificent Seven, hyperscalers, AI, all this stuff, and you mentioned this earlier, we need more energy. We need, we need more traditional all energy. Forms. We yeah. probably need we probably need all the above, you know, above the, the three mile island. And, and so, so, so we, think, we think that there's a herd behavior bias, there's a consensus bias. And, you know, something that I mentioned in, in a video that I recently cut that you watched, I'm grateful for your watching, is called the availability heuristic. 
Right. And what the, the availability heuristic does is if you hear about something 10 times a day, you kind of, you'll take it for granted. You won't really do the research. Well, turn on any weather channel. And I know that the hurricane has been a tragedy. Yep. The hurricane that we're witnessing right now has been a tragedy. The fact is we've been so successful as a human race. We've built up a lot of areas. And in the last, I don't know, 200,000 years, there have been tens of thousands of hurricanes to hit right. that area. We've built a lot of civilization in that, in that area. But my point about the availability heuristic, if I may finish, is if you keep hearing that, that all extreme weather is due to climate change, then it'll be obvious to you to invest that way and right. buy one of the 2000 ESG funds. It's funny, speaking of you know 20, 2016, around the time of the Paris Accord, around the time of overproduction in the Permian, we had this gigantic hurricane in New York. We had Sandy around that time. Oh yeah. And people said, look, Sandy was disastrous. This is, this is absolute proof that climate change is real. And, you know, our friend Doomberg, he's not really my friend, but I love the guy. Yep. He, did, he did a post about six weeks ago about the great Northeast hurricane. I think it was 1938 or 1939. Right. Absolutely buried cities, you know, up, up, and down the, up and down New England. And it was probably 10 times worse than Sandy. The fact is we had a lot more, a lot less value at risk in 1938 than we did wow. when Sandy struck. So these things are real. But they've been happening since the dawn of time, yep. and people love to connect them with climate change, and they just share zero evidence with them. No, and I love Doomberg. He, I, I've I had the uh, privilege of having him on, I think, three or four podcasts, yeah. and I just yeah. love every single interaction I've had with him. In fact, I was with David Blackman in Houston at a, a NAEP, and we actually had Doomberg live. And there was a line to get an autograph of a guy in a green chicken suit. So I mean, he, he wore a suit? No, he showed up on video, but and we put a TV. Oh, on. but well, it, it was it was everybody was like, "Oh, you all are doing clickbait." Well, you got to do what you got to do when you get to talk to Doomberg because he's, he's the best. He is a cool cat or bird. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. But what there's also there's there's. Go ahead. Uh, no, uh, wait, this is amazing because what you're seeing out there, what is, what are you seeing on the on coming around the corner? Because we have AI, they're you know investing in nuclear, they're trying to do this. Where are you seeing the financial markets heading, or what is your big goal right now, David? Well, thanks. I, I, I well, I'll, I'll pivot away from from behavioral finance, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about some research that. My energy advisor has done, you may have run into her, Christine Guerrero, and she published a couple of days ago, a long form analysis of wastewater in the Permian. And, you know, you, you're, you're more of an energy guy than I am, but I, I can give you the, I can give you there. I, I believe there will be geopolitical ramifications from this. I'll give you the, the 90 yeah, cool. second version. We're taking it very seriously. The 90 second version is you know, by definition, if you are fracking in, you know, a tight basin, you can't just pump the wastewater back in to keep pressure up as you would in a conventional well. We right. know that a lot of the salt water is eight to 10 times more salty than seawater. We know there are isotopes in them and some hazardous chemicals. Oklahoma has recognized this problem. Yep. New Mexico has recognized this problem. Without getting into regulations, we don't believe that Texas has recognized the problem and the wells are getting gassier and the water water over uh, water to oil ratios are going higher all else equal and yeah. if and if and when this is recognized i believe this will be actually a geopolitical realization and people in riyadh and new york city and london and beijing will stand up and say and recognize frankly what a gift the Permian has been as a swing producer to global consumers of oil. Again, this is completely apolitical, but it has right. been a miracle. And if right. if it weren't for the Permian, where would it be? 90 bucks, It'd be 100 more bucks, that. 115, I don't know, right? Yeah. So to, to, to just round out that thought of, you know, we actually think in the next couple of years, this will be recognized, maybe in the next couple of quarters, it'll be right. recognized by the world. And if and when the Permian either gets tired or there's a regulatory 
issue, right. then, then the other side that kicks in, which is Octane's medium term view, is Arjun Murthy, formerly of Goldman Sachs, talks about this a lot, which is what happens when even incrementally non-OECD countries step up a right. little bit. And he, he talks about, you know, in his videos, wonderful videos, talks about India right now is right. A, a barrel and a half per capita per year. We're around 20. Northern right. Europe's around 18. Southern Europe's around 12. What if India inches towards five barrels per capita per year? Right. We've got a different situation. And right. if you look at, you know, Exxon Mobil's 2050, they just released this, I think, Exxon Mobil's 2050 outlook, we've got a whole lot of decline globally. And I think OPEC, oh, OPEC's obviously, obviously talking their own book, but OPEC echoed that in the last month. But it, it's not to say it's not true. Right. We see the exciting basins that have been discovered, Guyana, Suriname, we're right. talking about maybe in five years, they're, they're, they get to 600 barrels. Maybe in five years, they get to a million, dollar, a million barrels. Permian's what, 6.2 bar- right. uh, million barrels a day. So, so we don't have to talk about a big impairment to the Permian to say, how, how are we replacing these, right? So right. Well, this is a macro picture. And Stu, I'm sure you and your colleagues could run circles around me. But as a capital markets guy, and as a former global macro guy, for right. my trading, I, I think this will have worldwide worldwide ramifications. I wonder what your thoughts are on that. Oh, I couldn't agree more. I, I like the way you articulated that in in that aspect. I think that the the more, in fact, I've found a trend that is really not talked about from an ESG perspective as well, and that is the more we put in money into a green new deal or renewable energy, the more Mm -hmm. fossil fuels we use. And that for the past four years, I've been tracking it and we are on track. So the more, let me say that again, the more money we put into renewables, the more fossil fuels we use. And it has been tracking. Okay. You know what? Last four years. All right. I'm going to say something. We're recording, right? I know oh, yeah. we are. September 30th, 20, <laughs> September 30th, 2024. Right. Turley's law. Turley's, uh, Turley's law was first became public. I there love it. Go. And it is, and it's, I've been talking about it and saying, wait a minute, it's not one or the other. We need more energy. We need all forms of energy, but the energy has to be physics matter to the grid, fiscal responsibility matters to the grid. The grid could care less about whether or not it, if if it's going to be fiscally irresponsible, that's green new deal. Now, where do solar panels really shine? Well, they shine on a housetop and a rooftop for those that can afford it. Then you visit with fi- folks like me that have an o- their own microgrid where I've got mm-hmm. twin propane generators. I'm near a hydro dam, but I've got wind, I've got solar, I've got all these others because I can afford it. Not everybody can afford it, but solar has, yeah. And so wind is abysmal. I mean, when you sit back and take a look at offshore wind and where that is going as a financial investment, it is actually robbery to think that that is going to be good for the environment. Solar, I see, is being more beneficial in many areas. I see some upside for solar. Nuclear, we talked about big time. I, I really believe that there's, like we, we laughed about, I did not have bing on that on my bingo card. I, I, I think we will see. Oh, that was very clever. Card. Bing, which is Microsoft's search engine. Very clever. Bingo card. Well, <laughs> let me, I'll, I'll agree. So, so I agree that the, the, the local use cases for solar are many. And I'll just go back to, I'll, I'll go back, I'll echo on, on offshore wind. You know, Wall Street, Wall Street spends globally, you know, the buy side, the sell side, we spend right. billions of dollars, Stu, on data and analyzing data, okay? Right. Here's the problem. I've seen all sorts of offshore wind stuff. I've seen, you know, I've talked to the UN pension. I've talked to just about everybody right. who, who, is, who are sponsors of these things. And I've asked these people, again, politely, collegially, sometimes in public, right. show us the carbon J-curve, okay? Right. So the J-curve, 
J curve is 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 common is a common term in private equity. What that means is, you know, you and I go out, we buy a fast casual restaurant train chain in Greater Chicago with you know fifty restaurants, right? We right. buy it from 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 a family. They they no longer want to run the business. What do we do? We we do some roll ups. We get some more casual fast casual restaurants. We do a marketing blitz. We do some hiring, right? So right. we've got to spend money. So so we we buy this we buy this asset and there's a J curve. We got to put more money into it. We right. Put more money into it, and then if everything goes right, we expand our margins. We expand our revenues. It comes out of the J curve. We're breaking even, and then we're, now we're really profitable. Right. And then we do an IPO. That's a J curve. Nobody has bothered. This is a hundred billion dollars later of offshore wind. Nobody's bothered to show anybody the carbon J curve. Okay. And David, how much they can't. Concrete, how much concrete? Do you know? Do you know California wants to use the space base down in Southern California as a jump off spot for their offshore deep water wind? They have to build new vessels. They have to build a port at the space base. They can't even figure out. They can't even figure out the economics of offshore wind in a hundred feet of sand water about right. 50 miles from me off a of block island on the long island sound that yeah. hasn't even been economical so yeah. i i don't i don't it, know it, what it, they're doing it, it they can't do it and in fact david when we take a look at offshore wind the they do not be they don't ever become profitable period and the only reason that they do make money is after five years that they get to shut them down reapply for more money from the Inflation Reduction Act, or as in Dan Bongino calls it, the Porculus Bill. And then they get to re-pull those turbines offline because maintenance-wise, they are out of warranty and they are too expensive to maintain after four years. People saying they last 30 are, are nuts. They don't even last four. And it's then nuts. when you take a look at, they are turbines, David, the definition of a turbine means they draw energy from the grid to turn the blades until they get to a certain point. That's where Scotland had 14,000 windmills, or they took down, excuse me, they took down 14,000 trees, but they're burning all this oil, diesel generators to turn the windmills to keep them going until they can get up to enough speed. And then they never eliminate the carbon footprint from the steel, from the concrete, from the diesel en energy, from the microplastics killing the whales. Wind, offshore wind does not make sense to me. Not at all. Not at all. And we'll we'll wait patiently for, for the statistics around oh, that. They can't give you a J curve. Sorry. You're right. You're right. But you you'd think they'd do it before they spend a hundred billion dollars of taxpayer money. Well, you mentioned a taxpayer money. Who makes money off of the taxpayer money? Yeah, the that's so true. The politicians getting the kickback from those firms. So, and when we take a look at New York and New Jersey, they're following in line with Germany was the Green New Deal, the original one. They have deindustrialized. UK says, hold my beer. UK You're totally is, right. Is gone bonkers. Then you take Gavin Newsom and you take Governor Holcomb and then the governor of New Jersey, all of them are vying for hold my Oktoberfest. I mean, this is just not even hold my beard. This is hold my Oktoberfest. You know how those waitresses walk by with 15 big steins of beer? <laughs> Sorry. It's it's really bad. And I, you know what? I would really love to see them. The three people you, you named Governor Murphy as well in New Jersey, former Goldman Sachs guy. Right. I'd like them to show us living, how to live without fossil fuels without for, for a week. Right. For just, just try for a week. And then I say, no, you know what? Just try a day. No, no, not a day. Try four hours because everything goes away. You don't have clean water. You don't have sewer uh, sanitation. No uh, and New York City, New York City wouldn't survive an hour without it. So it's 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 simply amazing. Well, I'll tell you, David. How do people get a hold of you? Well, you can find me on LinkedIn, David Allen CFA, and DM me. You could also go to our website, Octane dot nyc and look i hope to be back i hope to uh, oh, collaborate absolutely. With you again on I, some content excuse me i think that this was such a great conversation i get excited because i got about nine thousand more things to visit with you i'd like to have you back 
and let's have a, a another series on this in the financial realm because your expertise, there's not many of you out there. And I mean that in a very nice way that you are a weird beast. And I, and I, that is a, I wouldn't put that on your resume yet, but that <laughs> is a meant to be a very high compliment. Well, I love it. Look, I, I take that as a high compliment and I'd love to collaborate with you again. And I'll, I'll close with this thought. Stanley Druckenmuller, who's one of the gods of, of hedge funds, said a few years ago, he said, you know, I love the guys from Texas. They're always a lot of fun, but I've never met one of them who hasn't asked me for money to put another hole in the ground. And so I think, I think what I am now, this strange beast, beast that I yeah. am, I'm actually perhaps a synthesis of, you know, Northeastern capital allocation who, who gets what you guys do, but also right. wants to do it in a way that, that makes sense for capital allocation. And that, that's why I'm so grateful to be here with you, Stu. Well, thank you for your time. And again, I cannot wait till our next one. Thank you, David. Let's do it. Thank you. Good to see you.